welcome aboard MV Freedom. If you're new to our channel, welcome. Be sure to subscribe. I'm Elizabeth, the first mate. And I'm Sean, I'm the captain. And we figured there's no better time to do a video about boat ownership and what it really means to own a boat and some big things to consider. Because a lot of people think you want a boat, but do you really want to own a boat? Yeah, right now more and more in the news you're hearing of people running out and buying boats and buying RVs. It's the perfect way to go social distance. Um, I can't travel with my family on an airplane, so I'm going to get one of these vessels and create my own vacation. And boats are very rewarding and definitely a whole lot of fun, but there's a lot of things to consider before running out and purchasing a large cruising vessel. Yeah, and we're a little hypocritical because in 2004, we did just that. We just bought a boat. <laughs> Had no idea what it, what it meant to have a boat. Um, fortunately for us, Sean is an engineer and he's super handy and has just learned along the way to do all the some of the maintenance work that's involved. But there's a lot more, so we wanted to chat with you and kind of give you, from our experience, some information that you might not have considered. So I guess the first thing, the big elephant in the room, is how much do boats cost? And that is so subjective based on the type of boat you want. There are so many different boats out there from 15 feet in length to 85 to 100, you know, it's all so subjective. Um, one of the websites that we found and to this day find super helpful is yachtworld.com. So if you're thinking about a boat, definitely head over to Yacht World and just start searching um, for boats in the length that you're interested in, um, in the area of the world that you live in. Um, because obviously if you're in Wisconsin, you probably want to buy a boat that's in the Great Lakes region versus having to ship something from one of the coasts. Um, but that'll give you a really good idea of what boats cost. And um, the differences in costs from even 20 to 25 feet, 30 feet and up in length. Um, that's always been our go-to website and you might find it helpful too. Yeah, Yacht World's a great place to find all boat listings in one place. You don't need to go to a dealer's uh, website or go talk to a dealer um, because they may just show you boats that they have, but all boats are listed on a MLS, a multiple listing service, and they're all viewable and searchable from Yacht World. So if you want to see the largest selection of listed boats, go to yachtworld.com. The next up, the next big expense if you're not going to be strictly trailering your boat from your home to the water um, for day use or maybe even a couple night overnight use is moorage and that's probably one of our biggest expenses is moorage you know where you're gonna keep your boat what marina you're gonna keep it in um, and for us now that we live aboard full-time we also pay an additional fee on top of our moorage um, or basically a premium to be able to live aboard in the marina so be sure to look around where you live and find out where are all the possible places, whether it's a marina or even dry storage, um, which is a great option if you've got a small enough boat, um, where they come and they pick up your boat from like three stories up, put it in the water and it's there when you get there and then they take it and you know you can pretty much come and go super easily. Um, but call around to places in your area um, or check out websites. A lot of marinas, I think most of them have all of their rates listed. So when you nail down the type of boat and the length of boat, um, that would be the next thing to look into. How much is it going to cost to keep it in a marina or um, a dry storage? And if you want to live aboard, check out what premium price you'll pay to live aboard and get yourself on a wait list because most marinas, um, at least everyone in our area and even some uh, marinas that we've looked into down the entire west coast, they either don't allow live aboards or it's a multi-year wait list. So get on a wait list, find out what it costs if that's um, the direction you'd like to go. The other thing with Moorage to be sure to ask about or confirm through their pricing on a website is if utilities um, like your electricity and water is included because that can also be a pretty big charge at the end of the month if you're um, if it's not in, if it's not covered in your mortgage fees as well as additional fees. We're lucky where we're at now in Seattle. We have one fee. It's everything is built into one monthly mortgage fee, so we know exactly what we're paying every month. In previous in our previous marina, we had um, extra fees. There was um, several surcharges and um, utility. Metered electricity. Yeah, metered electric electricity fees. 
um, that changed every month. And some months it was a pretty big change from the previous month. So we never quite knew what we were paying. We knew uh, within $100 what we were paying, but it, it could swing quite a bit. Yeah, you would think a boat is small, so how much can the electricity bill really be? On the flip side, a, a boat isn't insulated like a home. So your heaters and air conditioning systems are, are generally going to work probably harder than what they would in a small home space. So those electricity bills can be, you know, sizable. Next big item for us is insurance. And this again is going to be subjective on the type of boat you choose to buy. Um, but it can be very costly and it can change. It, it does change if your cruising ground is changing and it changes depending on the credentials that you have. So Sean, for instance, is um, a licensed captain for, through the U.S. Coast Guard. So we get a little break in our insurance. Um, but if we travel farther out of our area, our region here in the Pacific Northwest, we have to pay more for our insurance. And also depending on the time of year, like if you're on the East Coast, your insurance company will sometimes dictate where you can and can't be during certain times of the year with hurricane seasons um, and stuff like that. So call your insurance agent or find an insurance agent and get some ballpark quotes because you might be shocked at how much you're going to pay for boat insurance. Yeah, and make sure that you can get insurance for that nice boat that you're looking to buy. If you have zero experience and you want to go and buy an 80-foot boat, the insurance company might say no. They might say you need to have a captain for so long um, or you know you need to demonstrate so much experience before they'll even insure you on that type of boat. So don't buy the boat first and then check on the insurance. You, know, you want to make sure that you're insurable before you buy the boat. Yeah, that's a really good point. A lot of this, it's kind of doing it all at the same time look for all these things as you're looking for a boat and then you'll you might change your mind on what boat you actually want for us in washington state um, this obviously would be specific to us this may apply in the state you live so you should definitely inquire but we have a washington state uh, registration for boats um, really a vehicle registration basically an excise tax in the amount of a half a percent of the blue book value of your vehicle and for boats that are a lot more expensive than a car, um, it, it's a lot more expensive. And it's something we didn't know when we moved here, and a lot of folks don't know until you get the bill in the mail. Know some of those costs. Find out if your state has any um, excise taxes or extra registration fees, because that's one of those things that hit you when you least expect it, and um, you should know about it in advance. Yep, and our boat's federally documented, so some may say, well, do you need to locally register it? And in Washington, the law is if the vessel is in the state for 60 days um, or more, then it needs to be registered in the state of Washington, so. State by state, there's a lot of weird rules. I mean, if you're an attorney and you're looking to buy a boat, like, more power to you, you know all the ins and outs. But there's a lot of weird rules and regulations, like if we were to take our boat into California for more than I think 60 days, we'd be subject to some taxes. So do some research, go onto the state's websites, either where you live or where you plan on cruising, and get to know some of those rules so you don't get stuck having to pay potentially thousands or tens of thousands of dollars that you had no idea was coming. By getting on with some additional fees to consider, the next one would be fuel. So fuel can vary wildly depending on the type of boat that you have. Our boat being a full displacement trawler is actually fairly fuel efficient um, as far as boats go. We typically, when we're um, cruising, we are burning about two and a half gallons um, an hour at about seven knots. So annually we burn about 1,500 gallons of fuel and that's usually for about 2,500 to 3,000 nautical miles traveled uh, in a given year and our generator usage. Um, so that's pretty good. But uh, for example, in contrast, our previous boat was a semi-displacement 40-foot Sea Ray with twin diesels, and that boat burned between 30 and 32 gallons per hour, um, cruising at, at 20 knots. So it really liked to, to drink the fuel. So you definitely want to put fuel into your consideration and, and, and your boat cost, uh, depending on what type of boat that you're looking at. The next thing um, to consider is haul-outs. So uh, boats have lots of maintenance that needs to be done, but haul-out is referring to all the maintenance that needs to be done below the water line. So paint, uh, boats that are in the water continuously have bottom paint on. Bottom paint prevents marine growth um, from being attracted to your boat hull and your running gear. 
um, and your through hole fittings and things like that. So every two years or uh, m maybe every year in warmer climates, the boat needs to be hauled out of the water so that paint can be reapplied and that you can also do all of your maintenance to um, items that are below the water line. So haul outs are something that you're not going to be able to avoid if you keep your boat in the water um, continuously and it's a charge that happens either every year or every two years and it can be relatively expensive so something to plan for. You're not good then for two years. When the boat is in the water, you need to have divers come and periodically uh, maintenance everything that's below the water line. And for us, that's every three months um, or four times a year where we need to go and change our sinks, clean our running gear, um, clean our coolers underneath the boat. And that's a service that uh, most people would pay a diver to go and do. Um, we have dive equipment and we happen to do it ourselves to save some money but that's another charge that is in relationship to the, uh, the underside of the boat and, and the maintenance that's involved. Then when there's a whole list of, of other maintenance items um, that we happen to do by ourselves, but many people, this would be a charge that they would pay an outside service for. Um, those things are uh, maintenance items like oil and coolant changes. Oil needs to be changed on our engines uh, twice a year. And there's three diesel engines on the boat that we need to do that service to, the main, the wing, and the generator. There's impellers that need to be replaced. There are stabilizers that need to be uh, serviced. Uh, the boat's in a corrosive environment, so there's a lot of cleaning, buffing, and waxing that needs to be done. We wash the boat uh, every week. Um, you can probably get away with twice a month. Every two weeks would be fine. But then the boat also needs a full buff and wax um, about twice a year where we're at. And, it, and that may be more frequent if you're in a, a climate like Florida where the sun's out every day and beating on your boat and and the UV is kind of breaking down your gel coat. So important to have your boat properly buffed and waxed on a regular basis. Things like water maker service, wood needs to be revarnished. If you have bright work on your boat that needs to be done, cleaning and replacing carpets um, is something you know that, that has a limited life to it as well. And then really a boat has all the same appliances that you would find in a house and those appliances need to be dealt with. They don't last forever, so heating and air conditioning units, uh, fridges and freezers, trash compactors, ovens, microwaves, all the same appliances that you would find in a house you have in a boat and you're going to need to maintain on a boat. They don't last forever. Depending on the boat that you're looking at, you might be looking at more of a day cruiser that doesn't have all the appliances, so you wouldn't have that. Recently, we thought we'd actually have to replace our fridge. Luckily, we didn't because Mr. Fix-It over here <laughs> fixed it, but we started to research what it would cost if we had to replace it. And we were seeing prices that were easily three times the price of what you would pay for a home fridge. Know that everything on a boat is special and runs a lot more than something in your house. So if you're buying a boat that has some of those amenities like your stoves, fridge, freezers, trash compactor, etc., just get a gauge on what that costs to replace because depending on the year of your boat, um, you might need to. We're fortunate Freedom's 16 years old and she's in great condition. Like, yeah. so much is working well. We haven't had to replace much, if anything. Also, some things too, um, so many people reach out to us saying that they're, they're looking for a trawler to do a lot of what we're doing, which is living on it and working from the boat. Consider all of your options in regards to Wi-Fi, hotspot, um, cable. Um, a lot of that stuff, if you're living in a marina, isn't as easy to come by. High-speed internet, like if you live at home or in an apartment and you're connected to, you know, a great, you know, we had like $40 a month, the best high-speed internet ever. We have now a lot more charges in terms of cell phone and internet because both of us have premium cell coverage with two different carriers to kind of cover us depending on where we are, to have as much data as we can get. And then we also have a hotspot um, that we've talked about before in previous videos. But all of that adds up to a lot more than what we've ever paid um, living on land for just basic connectivity and internet. So if you're also planning on trying to live aboard or cruise a lot and work from your boat, factor some of that in because it can add a couple hundred bucks easy, easily to each month. So all the different things to consider about when buying a new boat. It's not as easy as just writing the one-time check for the purchase price of the vessel and then putting a little bit of fuel in it. There's lots to consider. When you're trying to understand what it costs to own a boat on an annual basis, we hear a lot of factor anywhere from 5 to 10% of the boat price. And we have found that to be really accurate. For us, 
um, when we totally eliminate just the boat itself and just look at all of our maintenance costs, what, everything we just talked about, which is everything we spend on freedom, so everything from mortgage insurance, the excise tax, all the way to maintenance and everything we buy for the maintenance projects, it equates to about 7% of the boat value. And in our previous boats, when we've just done a little guesstimation of like, okay, what are we kind of spending annually? What was the, what did the boat cost? It comes out to the same, about five to 7%. So that is a, a good stat to go by if you're looking to buy a boat. I would aim on the high side, yeah. especially if you're a new boat owner, just assume 10% of that boat value is what you're easily what you're gonna spend annually. Um, again, you can get away with some things if you're trailering the boat and you don't need to moor it and you know have it at a marina, that's gonna save you a ton. And if you're doing all the work, it's gonna save you a ton. And if you have a smaller boat, because definitely with boats, we've said it before, we'll say it again, bigger is not better. With each foot you go up, you go up in costs, maintenance, moorage, all that. And these are costs too that you're gonna incur during your entire ownership of the boat. So when you, know, you get sick of the boat and you're not going to use it. The costs don't go away until you get rid of the boat or um, you know, sell the boat. Not just because we use our boat a lot that the costs are high. The costs are there whether you use the boat or not. Like buying a camper and if you don't use it, you can go park it in the back corner of your yard or go park it on your driveway. Um, you know, and it can sit there for a, a year and be just fine. It's when a boat's in the water, it needs to be maintained and it needs divers and it needs paint and it needs, you know, all these various things done to it. So we hope you found this helpful, and if you're a new, a potential new boat owner, we certainly hope you found this helpful in your search for a new boat to find what works for you and your budget. So yeah, thanks for joining us for that, and if you want to stick around, we're going to do some Q&A. Our first question this week comes from Eric in Tacoma, in our neck of the woods. And Eric is asking, what made you relocate to the Pacific Northwest since Sean's job is in Wisconsin and he commutes back and forth? So that's a great question. And it was actually my career and my job that relocated us out here. Um, I worked in retail merchandising for 13 years and got a job at a great retailer based in Seattle who relocated us out here in April of 2014. And Sean didn't think he'd be traveling as much as he had been up until coronavirus. But shockingly, you know, six years flies by and still yeah. traveling. Yeah, to be fair, we relocated because, you know, we wanted to experience the, the boating that the Pacific Northwest offers. It offers some of the best boating that I think you're going to find anywhere in the world. Um, so, like Elizabeth said, she found a career out here that allowed us to make the move. I continued uh, employment with my employer, which I've been at for 21 years now. I enjoy uh, working for that employer, but I very much enjoy uh, living out here and the lifestyle that it provides us. So the way to make both of those happen is, is a commute. We had visited here a couple times prior to me finding a job and we decided this was like the best place for us. We fell in love and the year round boating was what we wanted. You know, a few months after we had decided that the Pacific Northwest and the Seattle area was for us, we were Seattleites. Thanks, Eric, for that question. And then uh, the next question comes from Ryan, Beth, Gracie, and Elena um, from Wisconsin. Hey, guys. Hey, uh, Ryan happens to be uh, my older brother, um, watches our channel, uh, submitted a question. It's a question that many people have asked is, what type of safety equipment do you have uh, on board Freedom? And the answer to that is we obviously have the, the bare minimum that the Coast Guard requires, things like signaling devices, flares, uh, life jacket, horn, um, fire extinguisher. We, we have all of that. But in addition to that, um, we have a few other things that we find uh, critical to our safety as well. And uh, The first one is an EPIR, emergency radio indicating beacon, which uh, connects to GPS. and. If, the, if we needed to be rescued, we could activate the EPIRB or it will self-activate if the boat would capsize. And that's gonna provide the Coast Guard um, all of our information, who we are, where we're located, and that we're in distress. And hopefully they'll send out um, a, a rescue um, to help us. So we have an EPIRB on the boat. Hopefully. Yeah. The, the next uh, thing that we have on our boat is you've all seen us cruising around in our inflatable boat. But in addition to that inflatable boat, we also have a lifeboat, an inflatable lifeboat that's mounted to the roof or the hard top of our pilot house. And that lifeboat is a six person capacity lifeboat. And it has, um, it has rations inside of it, emergency rations of food and supplies. And if the boat were to capsize, 
the lifeboat would automatically deploy and blow up and we could crawl into the lifeboat um, to shelter until we're rescued. So our lifeboat, they need to be certified every so often. That's something that we need to do uh, soon. We're actually overdue on. So we're going to try to see if we can film that in an upcoming video so you guys have an opportunity to see how those boats the deploy and where it's stored on our vessel. Another item that we have is uh, communications we feel is important. So cell phones only work so far and VHF radios only work so far. And if you're planning to travel, um, you know, offshore more than five miles or so, uh, we find it to be important to have satellite communications on the boat. So we have a, a KVH um, track phone, which is satellite phone and data. And that allows us to make a phone call really anywhere um, in the world. So it's not yeah, inexpensive service, but if you need it, it's invaluable. So that's something else that we have for safety. Any more questions? Um, well, yeah. yeah. Okay, next question is from Brett in England. He says, um, you said that Alaska was in the future and maybe Hawaii, but do you think that the Med or even Europe may be in the cards? Um, so yes and yes. Um, that's something we talk a lot about, especially having a dog on board. With Sully, there's a lot of different quarantine restrictions and, and rules that we have to be cognizant of depending on the countries we go to. Um, and we've been finding that South Pacific, Australia, New Zealand are some of um, the harder places to cruise with a dog. And Sully's seven years old and we we're, he's part of our family, we're not going to leave him behind. When we think about Sully and what's best for an animal on board, definitely, you know, more of the East Coast um, going over to Europe and even the Med um, seem to be a little easier for us. So yes, we hope to make it over there and that would be a pretty epic experience cruising in the Mediterranean. So thank you, Brett. Um, and last question is from Steve and I'm hoping to not butcher this. Gananoque, Ontario, the heart of the Thousand Islands. And it sounds like a pretty awesome place to cruise. Hopefully we'll get there. Um, Steve asks, is MV Freedom your first boat and had you planned to live on it all along? What's your biggest voyage planned and did COVID cancel those plans? Freedom is our fourth boat. We've been boating since 2004, right after we got married. It's funny, we're, we're sharing with you all these things to consider before buying a boat and we never considered any of them. We got married and like two months later bought a boat. But we started small and worked our way up to Freedom, which I think was helpful as well. You, you learn sort of everything you need to know about boating and I mean, you continue to learn every boat that you get, but we stepped up. So our first boat was a 24-foot Glastron pocket cruiser, which we had for about seven years. And then we upgraded to a 36-foot Carver sports sedan, which was like a condo on the water. Great boat. And that boat, um, the GG2, she was named, she relocated out to Seattle with us in 2014. And then we sold her about nine months later and bought Orca, the 40-foot Sea Ray, cruised with her for three years and then two years ago we bought Freedom. And this has kind of been our, our dream for a long time to have this trawler to take us to all these places that we want to go. So yes, we, in anticipation of, of owning a trawler, we did always want to live on it, knowing that you know once we're cruising it's going to be our home. So we're fortunate that we got a live aboard slip when we did. And then what's your biggest voyage planned and did COVID cancel those plans? So we hadn't really planned yet to be doing some long passages. Our first stop, you know, once we start cruising full time, which, you know, we're hoping is sooner rather than later, will be Alaska. So that'll probably, that'll be our first longest passage, which is, what, 800 nautical miles? Yeah, but this summer we did have plans to go into British Columbia, which um, obviously we weren't able to do with the border being closed. Yeah. So we just had to change our plans a bit for our summer cruising this, this year. Yeah, in our 40-foot um, sea ray, we circumnavigated Vancouver Island, which was an amazing trip. Um, we love British Columbia. It's our favorite cruising ground that we've ever cruised in. So yes, um, COVID canceled those plans, but we've had an amazing time just in our own area, checking out some new places. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So thank you, Steve, and thank you all for those amazing questions. Um, we are going to continue answering more of them at the end of our videos every week. Um, next week, we'll get back on to our usual travel videos. If you've got more questions for us and you want them answered semi-live on these videos, be sure to leave your name, your location, and your question either in the comments below um, or check us out on Instagram and uh, direct message us there. So at MV Freedom Seattle on Instagram, or you can check out our website too, mvfreedomseattle.com.
Hopefully we didn't bore you with this long video of just us talking. Next week we'll get back to um, one of our more regular travel vlogs. So thanks for watching and have a great week. Yeah, thanks for watching guys. Take care.